Hi. I'm going to start off with a personal story. Since I was a little kid, I was always keen on helping through solving problems. My earliest memory was when I was fourth grade, and me and my sister were in a village house with my grandparents, and it was winter. I have to mention that my sister meant the world to me, so her happiness was my everything. The only amusement my sister had that winter were the Christmas lights as ornaments, and she was so keen of them. One day, the lights broke, and my sister started crying. Well, note that it was a really, really important task for me to make her happy, and I didn't know what to do, but I was really determined to help her out. Because, you know, seeing your best friend smile like that is the most precious thing in the world. So, I acted quickly. I plugged off the Christmas lights. I took a knife in one hand, I took the controller in the other hand. I screwed off with the knife the tiny screws, I took the cap off, and I saw on the board a wire that was broken, it was off of the board. And I tried to think quickly of how can I fix this. And I saw this long metal uh, sort of a poker for the fire, and I put it in the fireplace, and it got orange. So when it turned orange, I took it off, and I soldered the wire on the board. I put the cap back on, I screwed the tiny screwdrivers with a knife, I plugged it in, and it worked. And it was really remarkable to me. And on that day, I knew I was born to do this, make people content by improving and fixing things with solving problems. So, my sister that day awakened a specific drive in me that felt almost instinctive for, well, to become a scientist and an engineer. It was crucial to be that person and to have that curiosity for problem solving around a sister with a terminal disease called muscular dystrophy. Unfortunately, I lost my sister when she was 16, and I was 18. And I was crushed, I was devastated. However, despite the abundant pain, incredible, amazing, and unbelievable things started happening to me on a specific date, 14th of April, the day of her birthday. Now, I always fell on the atheistic, skeptical side of the belief system, and after her loss, I try to this day to explain everything through pure scientific evidence. And I always argue that it's merely a coincidence that it's only in my head that I make these events on 14th of April to sound so incredible, just because parts of me miss her terribly. And although I'm devoted to skepticism, I couldn't help but wonder if there's a link from the future to the present and the present to the past. Because she knew all of my passions and everything I've ever dreamed of, and somehow, weirdly, after her passing, many of my dreams came true, precisely on 14th of April, when I strongly felt her presence. And while she was alive, when I was with her, I was constantly thinking of the horror that the future will bring and what kind of emotional void would her inevitable passing leave me with. I was paralyzed from fear because I knew that the reality will hit me stronger than the fear itself, and I should appreciate her while she's here. And now it almost feels like my reality, this present, somehow compensates for the future pain I was preoccupied with back then again rewarding me with the presence and realizations of my dreams, so it just hurts less. But no matter what's the instinct of oneself, a good scientist should be aware that without implementing the skeptical scientific method, even intuitions about, about our own intuitions are just as likely to be wrong as our intuitions themselves. Because our perception as human beings is really narrow, it's just so limited. So, I couldn't handle myself but test and research 
if my subconsciousness justifies my instincts, or if somehow this bedazzling idea that I kept repeating over and over in my mind made any sense. Although that teenage idea of mine was really absurd in real life, it did guide me to find something really interesting on the atomic level. I stumbled upon something called retrocausality, and I started following amazing theoretical physicists and researchers such as Ken Wharton, Hugh Price, Matthew Leifer, and Emily Adam, as well as others, who are also trying to make a better sense of quantum physics, considering the possibility that the future can influence the present, and the present can influence the past. Now, here comes the hard part, just made a little bit easier. Raise hands if you're interested in quantum physics. Okay. Well, Firstly, in order to understand what I'm talking about, let's tackle and simplify down something called entanglement. Entanglement is a term used in quantum theory to describe the way that particles of energy or matter can become correlated to predictably interact with each other, regardless of how apart they are. The experiments that show this are very strange and really hard to interpret. Even Einstein called them spooky action at a distance. Most interpretations of these experiments lead you to think that there is either weird action at a distance, which means that the particles are somehow influencing each other, even when they're separated by large distances, in a way that cannot be explained by any known mechanism, or that is no free will, just no free will at all. But luckily, there's a third option that can get rid of this weird action at a distance, and can say free will. And you guessed what's it? It's called retrocausality. Although a very appealing concept, let's cl clarify what retrocausality really is. It doesn't mean that signals can be just communicating from the future to the past. Such signaling would be forbidden, even in a te retrocausal theory, due to, ter due, due to thermodynamic reasons. Instead, it means that when an experimenter chooses the measuring settings in which to measure a particle, that decision can influence the properties of that particle or another particle in the past, even before the experimenter made its choice. In other words, a de decision made in the present can influence the past. The fact that due to my sister I came to this knowledge is soothing and it really satisfies my preferences, instincts, and beliefs. It's quite convenient for me, isn't it? Even in intangible theories, I was making connections with my sister, or my brain was doing it. For example, when I discovered that physicists in the Netherlands performed quantum ent entanglement theories using electrons in diamonds, located at labs far enough apart to confirm that no hidden signals could be influencing the results, I was making this connection again. In short, if you think that everything exists in space and time and there is no action at a distance or no faster-than-light influences to that, it follows that some hidden variables at the start of these experiments have to be correlated with the experimental choices that we make near the end of the experiment. Now, if you focus on the picture, you can see that the labs are really far apart and that not even the speed, of light, the speed of light can interact and, uh, and mix with the experiment. Based on research like that, it's possible that quantum weirdness is due to hidden retrocausal influences. And if so, then there is really a new link between the present and the past. So retrocausality saves free will, but also doesn't discount the future as much as one normally does. It's also possible, at least in my mind, that after discovering, studying, and understanding this, my imaginative brain tried to make cute connections, comparing the sister bond between the two of us to the two intangible particles, corresponding or correlating it to two people who start out, uh, start out life together and then end up in different places, and yet there's still some sort of connection between, a, between them at a distance. Have you ever felt this? this vast connection with somebody, although very far away? I know I have. My brain can simply draw an analogy 
between those two entang entangled particles and between the two sisters, her and me. In entanglement, there are surprising connections between the particles, and even if they're after they're separated, those connections can span different times as well. But when you find out something about one particle, you find something about the other too, even if it's far away in space and time. Now, if retrocausality is correct, then choices made today can influence hidden variables that existed years ago. Boom! My brain just made another co connection with my sister. I could talk about things that I never knew about my sister, that I wish I asked her, but I never did. I can compare to the hidden variables at the start of the entanglement experiment. So maybe that way, there's still a way to learn something, or from my sister, even now. However, this is in fact distorted reality for us, plain three-dimensional human beings. And the skeptic, the scientist in me, can't seem to help but ask if entanglement phenomena are just the closest thing we have to reproductible magic. So far, because even physicists can't agree as to what's really going on. Is it spooky action at a distance? Is it super determinism of our choices? Or is it retrocausality? There are many fights over this topic, and many researchers state different things. So, in circumstances like this, when every explanati explanatory option seems unacceptable or incomplete or not full or complete, a good skeptic should force its nature and really try to try to train the skepticism, but inward. Decomposing towards our strongest intuitions, like all of those childish, childish teenage ideas of mine, that were usually crumbled in front of pure, tested scientific facts and repetitive evidence which couldn't be biased. In conclusion, we can implement that this can be put in real life as well. We can implement this in real life. As hormonal, heavily influenced, somewhat limited human beings, we have many distorted realities. We are confused, we're vulnerable, unpredictable, and we often tend to go to our one only truth, and that narrows our views. However, in fact, one single story usually has many truths. So, let me use this moment to call to action. You don't need to be a theoretical physicist to seek for the truth and try to improve the world. Explore more, test, listen to both sides, objectify, find all the evidence and then recheck it again. Give chances to new approaches, new views, and new theories. Use the skeptic scientific method and just don't go with your gut. Don't trust your own instincts. Don't prioritize the first offered explanation. And don't prioritize comfor um, comforting, convenient explanations. Keep an open mind. Because change of side or change of view is not always a bad thing. Usually, sometimes, it really gives you more options. Most importantly, use your pain to fuel you until exhaustion, to do and learn inspirational and great things. And mind you that today is 14th of April, and I'm doing another dream of mine, a TED Talk. So happy birthday, sis. What a lovely way to pursue my dreams to science in order to figure out the truth and honor you. Thank you.